Yes, you're right. Okay. Um, I also wanted to just make a general announcement while we have the recording going that um, if there's anyone who wants to do a nomination for early career short talks, uh, now is the time to do that. I think, uh, did we have a deadline for those nominations? I don't think we have a deadline, but we're the time is approaching. So please uh, yeah. let us know if, if you know any students or if you'd like to nominate any students. Yeah, decisions are being made soon, so um, great. OK, so let's uh, continue on to hear about backstable functions. Right, so a backstable function uh, is, uh, so the so backstable functions, they live inside uh, power series in now in by infinitely many variables. So I've got um, a variable for um, for every xi, and now when you say when people say power series, they're used to doing things like one plus x plus x squared dot dot dot. So that's not what I want. I um, I want things to have a finite degree, and so that means that it's more like sure functions, right? That uh, it's more like the ring of symmetric functions, which one says so people you know, in, incorrectly say the ring of symmetric functions is the, um, uh, is those power series that are invariant under swapping the variables, but, um, uh, but you don't, you probably don't want that. You probably only, you, it, certainly you wouldn't want that if you want to say the sure functions are a basis of that thing. So I'm going to insist on, uh, uh that, uh, that any particular back stable function only has, is probably homogeneous, honestly. But uh, if I'm if I want to be able to this thing be closed under plus, I better allow it to have finite degree instead of uh, insisting it be homogeneous. Okay. Um, and secondly, um, uh, it doesn't use or let's say um, it uh, it uses only those x i where i is less than some what some bound. So. The, the obvious example is x5 plus x4 plus x3 plus x2 dot 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 forever towards the negative variables. That doesn't use anything past x5. Um, so there should exist a, there should exist some m such that it only uses um, the variables less than that. And it should be symmetric in xi where i is less than some other guy n. So it messes around with finite variables for a while, but once you get to sufficiently negative variables, then it becomes a symmetric function. So it's a you could say it's some sum of symmetric functions in the negative variables times polynomials in all the variables. And so we get this genus, the uh, well, two, we get two things. One is we get this um uh, we get this ring of back stable functions. So it's it's these guys as a subring of power series. And this has a basis of, I'll call them BS um, pi, where pi is in the vial group for a z. So this is permutations from z to z that only move finitely many things. For each one of those, there's a backstable Schubert function that has these things. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so it's got a basis consisting of these. So this is a picture then of the ring um, H of A Z. So it's a <clears throat> Um, so it's a genus in that sense. Uh, let's see. So it's on this ring that uh, um, that the Neneshev operator is acting. One way to think about what's going on is to um, what the relation is between this C and this nabla. So there's an extra symmetry that you get when you work back stably that you don't have <clears throat> when you're thinking about usual Schubert polynomials. You can take a permutation of Z 
and you can conjugate it by the shift operator that takes i to i plus one. And that's that's an automorphism of the of the group. It's an automorphism of the um, <clears throat> of the um, ring of uh, Schubert symbols. Um, and it conjugates nabla to nabla plus C, right? Because it's changing the I. So remember the coefficients of nabla. Um, uh, nabla was this sum of I um, uh, Marshall I. And if you do this shifting, I'm saying it'll change this to I plus one, but, change, but that'll stay I. So if you take if you take nabla and you conjugate it by shift and you subtract nabla, you get C. So <clears throat> that's a um, uh, that's maybe the right um, the right symmetries to think of that we have these infinitesimal symmetries coming from these, and we have this other one coming from shift, and uh, and that's how they're related. Okay, so. Um, one thing I'm going to head for is um, making use of the fact that these are derivations. We can um, uh, we can exponentiate them and get actual automorphisms. So that's the that's the fun property of uh, of once you have Leibniz is that you exponentiate and uh, and you get an actual automorphism. So, hey, Alan, you have a question um, whether. Yeah. Whether well, backstable function ring is just a polynomial ring in some infinite set of variables. It is. Um, <clears throat> it is just a polynomial ring, and that's because there's another map to this ring from the ring of symmetric functions. Tensor is a polynomial ring, so this is just ordinary brackets in all variables. And so I want to go so. You know what this what this homomorphism is probably going to do on here. It will take a polynomial in the xi's to this power series in the xi's, right? Certainly, if I have a polynomial, then it satisfies these three conditions. But where I want a symmetric function to go is so if I have um, uh, I'm running out of letters that for for s How about uh, sigma lambda um, uh, that that no, I'll call it sure sub lambda. So where sure lambda goes is to the symmetric function, but I'll plug in the negative variables. So every, now, let, let me give an example of what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> Consider the backstable function coming from uh, S um, R minus four. So that's equal to um, X sub minus four plus X sub minus five plus X sub minus six forever. Okay. Now, how do I see this power series in the image of this? Well, I'll say that's coming from the sure function uh, for a single box. But when you plug in, when you take the sure function for a single box and you plug in negative variables, then you get the sum of all of those. And I don't want that because I want not this, so I'm going to subtract off x naught up to down to x negative three. So here's a guy in the image of this map. Now, this one is also known to be a polynomial ring in the, um, for example, the elementary symmetrics. So the, the sure sub of columns. So Here's a polynomial ring, here's a polynomial ring, they tensor a polynomial ring, this is a polynomial ring. In kind of in kind of three times the natural many variables. So there's the there's my um, there's my columns that could be some natural number height, and then there's my natural number of variables on this side, my negative natural number of variables on that side. That's how big this polynomial ring is, this ring of back stable functions. 
there another question now or is that it? Nope. Um, that's right. So so Dave was talking about the back steeples as well and was uh, um, uh, was thinking of them more in this picture than um, so here. The, the thing that I find a little weird in this picture is why did I plug the negative naturals into here as opposed to plugging in um, the variables five and below or the variables negative 12 and below? Why did I plug in the variables zero and below? There's a whole bunch of different isomorphisms of this ring with this. And uh, so like on here, the shift operation I said is, is very clear. It takes xi to xi plus one. And on here, it's pretty weird. So on this part, it's taking xi to xi plus one, but then these sure functions are getting all mixed up with those. So, uh, so I prefer this picture where the shift symmetry is manifest, um, although abstractly, yes, it's a polynomial ring. All right, I want to show you. Um, let's see, I want to show you something fun that Nedeshev did, but maybe I will have to uh, um, uh, allude get get to it at the very end um, as part of a a, a a refined version that uh, um, that we did. So I'm going to start a completely um, other story, and then relate it. So inside the flag variety in CN, and there's a more general version of what I'm going to say um, <clears throat> due to Kliochko. There's a more general version of what I'm going to say that he did for arbitrary um, finite semi-simple um, uh, complex Lie groups, but I'm going to be specifically thinking about this one. So inside here, I'm going to take some general point and I'm going to hit it with the torus. So T, of course, is the diagonal matrices. I'm going to hit some general point in here with the torus and I'll get a subset of here. And then I'm going to take the closure. And the thing I get is called the um, uh, permutahedral toric variety. And since this is being recorded, I'm going to point out that I think there should be an A there, not an O. Um, and uh, I think the people who put an O there should be forced to talk about tetrahedra and octohedra. So I got the permutahedral toric variety. I'm just going to call this guy uh, TV perm. Okay. So what Kliachko thought about was let's consider the map uh, from cohomology of the flag variety to cohomology of the permutahedral toric variety. And I want to say this, this toric variety, um, it's a, it shows up a bunch of places. It's, it's a Hessenberg variety for the um, regular uh, semi-simple case. Um, it's, a, it's very important in a bunch of uh, Jun Ha's work. Um, it's a um, it's a weirdly smooth like if you did if you studied this guy not inside the flag variety but inside say um, gr24 then the polytope for it would be a permute excuse me would be a an octahedron uh, and the corresponding toric variety wouldn't be smooth so strangely this is a manifold living inside here and uh, and Kliachko thought about this induced map on cohomology back to that manifold. Now it turns out this map on cohomology is not onto. It's a, it only hits what I'm going to call uh, the Kliachko ring. So it has some image and Kliachko gave a nice uh, presentation of that. So he says, this is, well, he only gives it uh, rationally. He says, it's sorry, no. Um, well, let me stick with rational, not to worry about. Um, I'm de definitely going to write down a formula that's only rational. 
So uh, he says in this case, it's um, it's generated by these X1 through Xn, modulo of the Kleochko ideal, which says that each number is either zero or is half the sum of its neighbors. Um, two. So those are the relations the Xi's should satisfy. Uh, maybe I want this to go from zero to N and uh, past the Ns we get zero. So um, that's a ring, but of course we're interested in rings with bases. So you wanna know when you take a Schubert symbol, where does it go? Under uh, under this map in this presentation, so this this map I'm going to call the Kleochko genus. Okay, this uh, here I've got a homomorphism from ring I'm interested in to another ring, and if you're thinking ahead to like what would the xi's look like when you impose these equations, wouldn't they all have to be zero? And the answer is not quite. They could square to zero, sort of thing. So this is defining some uh, some ring with nil potents. But that shouldn't be a surprise because we're thinking about it as a quotient of a cohomology ring, and this, of course, is some, you know, is some Artinian ring with the full of nil potents. All right. So where does S pi go under this map? It goes to uh, one over the length of pi factorial uh, times the sum over reduced words of pi, and I'll use a capital P as a typical reduced word for pi. And then we take the product over the letters in there of the xi's. So that's the map. Now, the thing I don't like about this formula is that it's um, uh, uh, that it's taking place in kind of a complicated ring. And so let's let's abandon the geometry that got us here and just consider um, let's just consider the case now when um, uh, when we go to the a z case. All right, so in the limit a z, I'm just going to say I'm dealing with this ring of Schubert symbols uh, a z. I won't worry about it being a cohomology of some bi-infinite flag variety. Um, I, I probably wouldn't could do that, but I'm not going to need to work that hard. And I'm going to go to rationals now in infinite many variables, um, but I still want to impose uh, these conditions. Okay, so this is now a genus on here, and, uh, and I'm going to use the same formula for uh, for this genus. So, what does this ring look like? And you know, it's it's still complicated. Could I maybe take quotients of this ring? Could I um, could I mod out a larger ideal and get something comprehensible? So, the when you think about like taking this ideal and seeing what are the minimal prime ideals that contain it. So saying maybe I could maybe I could get this guy as an intersection of other ideals. And then instead of modding out this complicated thing, I'll mod out those ideals one by one. And each one of those, each one of those quotients will give me partial information. And, uh, and I'll try and stitch that information together. So that suggests that you want to quotient this, sorry, you want to find ideals that contain this. And so the Dolstellensatz, I'm now going to completely misapply because I'm in infinite dimensions, but I'm going to do it anyway and say, let's think about the solution set to these equations. So these equations say that each number is either zero or it's half the sum of the neighbors. And you get things like this, where you'll have zeros for a while, and then coming off here, you'll have two, four, six. And coming back there, you'll have five, three, one, right? So here's a way of, so like here I might have x1, x2, x0. Here's a way of uh, um, of uh, solving these equations where you have zero for a while, but then 
Once you stop being zero, you're going to have to have this linear behavior we saw before. And it turns out that all of those, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of different um, minimal primes that contain this ideal. Um, and most of them look like this. And there's one other guy that doesn't, which is the one where you don't have any zeros. You just have a single affine linear function instead of these two, uh, these two linear functions at the ends. So you get this further quotient, which is just that same thing, but now I will leave off Sorry, I can, can I just, the, uh, just to check my understanding, is that should 531 could, something seems oh, off. Sorry, sorry, that's okay. Like, like, uh, like 321 yeah, maybe? No, uh, 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 321, sorry. 321, okay, great, thanks. Right, so you want to, you want to deal with the bigger ideal that just says each number is half the sum of the neighbors, um, don't, don't uh, settle for it being zero. And that ring is very simple. That's just a Q bracket AB. So uh, it's just that uh, XI is, um, um, uh, so a, the map is um, uh, on spaces is that, uh, well, XI, you know, I guess the map is XI maps to AI plus B. So there's an isomorphism of this of this further quotient. And I could argue, but I'm out of time almost, um, that all the other quotients you get are going to be useless for Schubert calculus. So this is the only one that really matters. OK, and now I want to say what the relation is between parts one and two and be done. So. We have the ring of Schubert symbols, and we have this uh, Kliatchko map, or maybe I'll call it this. Uh, it's it's not even the Kliatchko genus anymore. Uh, I'm just going to call it this affine linear genus. So this composite where we we impose, we impose not just the Kliatchko equations, but actually we go all the way to Q bracket AB. So, so that's, a, that's, that's this genus. Um, and I'm going to use the Nabla and Psi that we had before. So I'm going to take A times Nabla plus B times Psi. And I'm going to exponentiate that. So this is now some inhomogeneous operator on this ring. Um, but that operator is, um, it's a ring automorphism. So it doesn't quite go here because it has this uh, um, A and B in it. So I need to tensor over Z with Q bracket AB. Okay, and then there's this form. Then there's a map from there to there, which takes all of the Schubert's to zero, except for um, uh, except for the identity that goes to one. So that's so that's this dumb ring that just says let's extract what's happening. Um, it's it's kind of an integration that takes only the the class one. Or maybe, no, it's better to say it's restriction to a point to take the class one. And so now I'm going to state the theorem, which is that this commutes. So it's more of an observation than a theorem. It comes from computing both sides independently and saying, isn't it weird that these are equal? Thanks very much. <laughs>